All right. Well, let's go ahead. Let's open up in prayer and then we'll dive right into the word and see what God has for us. Father God, we thank you so much, Lord, for your beauty, for your grace, for your mercy, all that you are, Lord. It's amazing what you've done in our lives. And God, I know that wherever we're at in life, wherever you have us on this journey called life, that you are are intentional with us. You desire to speak to us, to share things with us, to impart to us, God. And I pray that this morning, God, we can gather here for the purpose of drawing closer to you. And in light of that, drawing closer to one another. God, we love you and we ask for your Holy Spirit to rest on this church this morning. Be with us. Lord, we also want to lift up our beloved pastor to you. We lift up the whole... Um, group that went with him on this adventure, on this journey, and we pray, God, for your protection over them. We pray for your peace. We pray, God, that this would be an exhilarating time for them to get rejuvenated, for them to grow in their faith, Lord, and experience and encounter you in an amazing way as they go to the Holy Land and where Paul walked and, and all throughout that area. Bless them, give them strength, give them courage, Give them the grace they need, Lord, to be able to make it home safely. And so we pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want you to open up your Bibles to the Gospel of John, chapter 6. And as you guys are doing that, I have a question that I want you to really examine yourselves with. I want you to ask yourself, what do I expect? And... Has your expectation changed from when you first came to Christ, first were, were, were stuck in your desperation and, and received his forgiveness, received his grace until now? Has your expectations changed? I mean, because we see in Scripture that takes place a lot with the people that decided to follow Jesus in the scripture, you'll see the word expectation and hope as a synonymous term. Hope is a vital part of our lives. Without hope, all we have is despair. And where you put your hope, where you put your expectation, actually defines what you're living for, what you're going after. It's a motivating factor in life. Now, if you put your hope and expectation in an unreliable source, well, then you're just setting yourself up for a failure. You're setting yourself up for a big letdown. The wisdom of God says in Proverbs that hope deferred makes the heart sick. You show me a hopeless man, I'll show you a dangerous man. And so the question is, where are you going to put your hope? Where are you going to put your expectation? Has it changed since you first came to Jesus until now? Unmet, unmet expectation is an open door for the devil to come in and steal your joy. Now, as you have opened your Bibles to the Gospel of John chapter 6, uh, most of us are familiar with this passage, the storyline that we see here. This is where Jesus feeds the 5,000. Now, you'll read in the beginning of this chapter that many came to Jesus because they saw the miracles which he had done. And so they pursued him to be able to hear his word. And so you have this multitude coming to Jesus now. And they're getting wary. They're getting tired. They've, they've traveled for miles upon miles. And Jesus turns to his disciples after he sees this multitude of people. It says 5,000 men. That's not counting the women and children that were there. And he says to Philip, one of his disciples, where are we going to get bread that all these people can eat? I mean, man, way to put somebody on the spot, right? I mean, if I was Philip, I'd probably be like, you're God. I don't know. 
But he comes up with something real witty and says something like, you know, 200 penny worth of bread isn't sufficient that all of these people may eat or just have a little piece. Now, 200 penny worth was over 200 days wages. And so Jesus uses this scenario to be able to show his glory. And he actually has all of the people sit down in groups of 50 upon the grass. And there's this boy here that has five loaves of bread and two little fish. And so he says, give me that. I'll take all of it. I mean, Jesus could have done the miracle with just one loaf and one fish, but usually he wants all you got, right? And so he takes the five loaves and he takes the two fishes and he does this miraculous miracle and multiplies it and everybody eats. He gives to the disciples and the disciples d uh, distribute to all the people that are there. Now when this takes place, everybody's happy, right? I mean, food was hard to come by at this time. And here this miracle worker was that could multiply food. And so everybody was lifting him up and, and rejoicing because, hey, you know, food's hard to come by and here this guy is and he's multiplying food. They wanted to make him king. And so I want you to look at what it says in verse number 15 here. Scroll with me. Verse number 15, look at the way that Jesus responds here as the, 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 the multitude wants to make him king. When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. Because Jesus knew that this isn't the way that it was supposed to be. Jesus didn't want to be their immediate gratifier. He didn't want to he didn't want to be their walking EBT card. You see, back then, you didn't have your local Costco down the street. And so this was, this was a big deal. Here a man is that, that can multiply food when food is so scarce and so hard to come by. The people wanted to make him king because of this. Because it was convenient, but Jesus knew that this wasn't the way it was supposed to be. So he departs and he goes by himself alone to seek God's will. And when that takes place, the disciples kind of calm the crowd down and want the crowd to disperse and go back to their homes. And then the disciples take up ship and they, they follow Jesus. And throughout the night, uh, some events take place to build the disciples' faith. And then the next day, they come into a city of Capernaum. And everybody, the multitude of people wake up in the morning and they remember, they remember that this, this, this man was a miracle worker, someone who, who could satisfy their empty bellies. They were looking for some breakfast. And so they took up shipping and they followed the disciples and followed Jesus the next morning. I want us to pick up the reading again here at verse number 24. Verse number 24, when the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there any longer, neither his disciples, they also took up shipping and came to Capernaum, seeking for Jesus. And when they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, when camest thou hither? Jesus answered them and said, look at what, he, look at what Jesus says here. Verily, verily, I say unto you, you seek me, not because you saw the miracles. Not because you saw the signs of who I was. But because ye did eat of the loaves and were filled. Now wait a minute. In the beginning of this chapter, it says that all of the people followed Jesus because they saw the signs. They saw that, that, that this man was the expected Messiah. But then, some circumstances took place. What happened? They got blessed. They got blessed. Materialistically, physically, naturally. 
And because of that, now their expectation had changed. Now they were looking for the handout. And Jesus calls them out right away and says, you're not seeking me because you saw the miracles anymore. Now you're seeking me because your bellies got filled. You're looking for breakfast. And then he drives home this point in the next verse. He says, labor not for the meat which perishes, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life with which the Son of Man shall give unto you. Why? For him hath God the Father sealed. The people came to Jesus expecting more food, more instant gratification, more materialistic blessing. But when they found him, now all he had to offer them was himself. He said to them, I am the bread of life. It's me. I want you to scroll down with me to verse 41 here. In verse 41, we see them start to complain because they weren't getting what they now expected from him. The Jews then murmured at him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. I think when we allow our expectations to shift from our humble beginnings, man, we can get derailed really easily. It can limit us from receiving what God originally intended and planned for us. I want you to look at the end result of their expectation not being met. Scroll down to verse 66 now. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. So why did they walk away? Why did they turn their back on Jesus? Because they came to Jesus expecting things on their terms, not his anymore. When we come to Jesus expecting things to be on our terms, man, the Word of God says that God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Gives grace to the ones who say, okay, God, whatever you desire, I'm willing to yield myself to you. Whatever you have for me, whatsoever is right. When you come to Jesus expecting things to be on your terms, it's only going to breed resentment and bitterness because God's ways are not our ways and his thoughts are so much higher than ours. Jeremiah spoke about this, the prophet. Jeremiah brings this charge against the people of Israel during his time when he's delivered the oracles of God. And you think that when Jeremiah comes and he brings down the hammer upon the people of Israel, man, that he's going to like roll out this long laundry list of crimes that Israel's committed, that the people have committed, that the kings have committed, that everybody's committed against God. But Jeremiah boils it down to just two offenses. Jeremiah chapter 2 verse 13 says, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed them out cisterns, Broken cisterns, in other words, broken wells that can hold no water. When you put all your expectation in these unreliable things in life, these unreliable circumstances, these unreliable people, it's like you're putting all your hope, putting all your desire, putting all your dreams into these cups with holes in them. They can't hold them. Everything falls out the bottom. Instead, church, we must come to Jesus like we see Peter coming to Jesus in the context of John chapter 6. I want you to look at the, the question that Jesus asks Peter in the next verse, in verse 67, after he sees the multitude of people leave, 
Jesus turns to Peter. Says, then Jesus said unto the twelve, Will ye also go away? Then Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. I want you to see this. In this passage, Peter's expectation never changed. Peter was following Jesus because of who he was. The promised one, the Messiah, because he had the words to eternal life that Peter had encountered something with Christ that he hadn't found in the world. And he kept following Jesus because of who he was. Not because of what he could do but because of who he was. In Luke chapter 9, Jesus is telling his disciples what they can actually expect when they choose to follow him. If we look at verse 58 in Luke chapter 9, And Jesus said unto, unto them, unto him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has not where to lay his head. And he said to another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. Jesus said unto him, Let the dead bury the dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. And another said, Lord, I'll follow thee, but let, them, let me go first. Uh, but let me first go bid them farewell which are at my house. And Jesus said unto him, No man having put his hand on the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Those are some tall orders. But Jesus never pulled any punches. He told it exactly how it was. And we see that. Jesus actually, in Matthew chapter 20, and I want you to turn here with me, tells us a, a short story with a spiritual meaning behind it, and it's really encompassed around where we're going to put our expectation. And I want you to turn here with me, Matthew chapter 20. And we're going to begin here at verse number 1. For the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is an householder, which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right I will give you. And they went their way. Again he went out about the sixth and ninth hour and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing idle and saith unto them, Why stand ye here all the day idle? They say unto him, Because no man hath hired us. He saith unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, that shall ye receive. So when even was come, the Lord of the vineyard saith unto his steward, Call the laborers, and give them their hire, beginning from the last unto the first. And when they came that were hired about the eleventh hour, they received every man a penny. But when the first came, they supposed that they should have received more. And they likewise received every man a penny. And when they had received it, they murmured against the good man of the house, saying, These last have wrought but one hour, and thou hast made them equal unto us? which have borne the burden and the heat of the day? But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I do thee no wrong. Didst not thou agree with me for a penny? Take that thine is, and go thy way. I will give unto this last, even as unto thee. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? Is thine eye evil, because I am good? So the last shall be first, and the first last. For many are called, but few are chosen. Jesus 
shares this, this small story to make a point to Peter. In the prior chapter, in Matthew chapter 19, we see the rich young ruler come to Jesus and and this is a, a boy that is performance-based, crosses all the T's and dots, all the I's. I mean, this is, he's on an accelerated fast track to success. Very disciplined in his own willpower. And he comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? Jesus goes, oh, well, you know, keep the commandments. The rich young ruler says, which ones? And Jesus lists off a few of them. The rich young Euler says, got him from my youth up. Jesus says, okay, you want to be perfect. Go sell everything that you have. Take, give it to the poor. Take up the cross and follow me. And then, see, this is just, just too much. This standard, this young man, even in his own disciplines and strength and willpower, he can't meet it. And so he begins to walk away sorrowful. And Peter's sitting back with the rest of the disciples and they're seeing what's taking place here. And Jesus says, it's so hard. It's so hard for a rich man to enter into heaven. It's easier for the camel to go through an eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the heaven. The disciples are like, then who can then be saved? Jesus says that with man it's impossible, but with God, all things are possible. And then Peter... I love Peter because he's always saying what everybody else is thinking. He has no filter. And he says, well, Jesus, we've left all and followed you. What are we going to get there for? Basically what Peter was saying is he's saying, I had a very lucrative fishing business and, and everything was going good. And I just dropped my business and I, I'm following you. What should I expect, Peter, or uh, Jesus? And so to be able to answer Peter's question, Jesus shares this parable with us. Now, in this parable, you have five employee groups, okay? Uh, I'm going to need some volunteers. I need five volunteers. <laughs> there we go. Come on. Are you guys the frozen chosen here? Come on, run up. The first five to get up here. Don't worry, you don't have to talk. You don't have to do anything. I just need five people. Awesome. Okay, if we could just stand in a line right here. Okay, awesome. So these are the five employee groups that are hired by the landowner throughout the day. Okay, the first one, the first one is, is uh, hired at 7 o'clock in the morning, or 6 o'clock in the morning, day, daybreak, that he's standing in the marketplace and the, the landowner goes, what are you doing standing here? You want a job? Okay, I'll give you a penny if you work for me today for 12 hours. The, 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 uh, the laborer goes, yeah, okay, let's go. Okay, so now there, there's this binding agreement that is made. And so he goes and he works. Come this way. He goes and he's going to go to work in the, in, the, in the vineyard for the day, right? All right, so you're working. And then the landowner comes back to the marketplace at like 9 o'clock in the morning and sees another group of people just standing around. He goes, what are you doing? Just standing around. He goes, nobody's hired me. And so then the landowner says to this man, he says, well, come and work for me for the day in my vineyard. And whatsoever is right, that's what you're going to receive. And he's like, cool. Yeah. Happy to have a job. Let's go. And so he comes and he works in the vineyard. Boom. Stand right there. Okay? And then the landowner comes back at uh, noon and he sees another group. And he comes back at 3 o'clock and he sees another group just standing around at, at noon and at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. He goes, what are you guys doing? Come on, come work for me and whatsoever's right, that's what you're going to receive. And they're like, let's go. I'm down. And so they come and they, they, they come to work. Go ahead and stand right here. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And then the landowner comes back at the end of the day, 5 o'clock in the afternoon, and he goes, buddy, what are you doing standing around all day? Nobody's hired me. And so he goes, okay, well, come and work for me, and whatsoever's right, that what, that's what you're going to receive. This guy's like, please, give me something. And so he's like, okay, come on. And it probably took, you know, 20 minutes 
to get to the job site anyways, right? So you end up working 40 minutes, right? And so now it's six o'clock at night, the 12 hour day's over, and it's time to pay the laborers. And so the landowner goes to his manager, he goes to his steward, and he says, okay, it's time to pay them. But we're gonna do things a little differently this time. We're gonna pay the ones that got hired last, we're gonna pay them first. So go ahead and turn around, guys. Thank you, thank you. We're gonna pay the ones that got hired at five o'clock in the afternoon, we're gonna pay them first. Now this isn't the way you'd usually do things, but the steward comes, and he pulls out all of his pennies out of his pocket and he comes and he drops a penny into the hand of the guy that got hired at five o'clock in the afternoon. Now when this takes place, you can just see it like all of the groups of laborers are standing in their spots waiting to receive their pay, right? And so when the steward drops a penny into the hand of the guy that got hired at 5 o'clock in the afternoon, probably worked a total of 40 minutes, what do you think the guy down here is thinking? <laughs> Woo! We're going to get paid today, right? I mean, and, and why wouldn't he think that way, Right? Because we think in terms of fairness. We think in terms of justice. We think in terms of des what I deserve. What I'm entitled to. Right? But obviously, he doesn't see the trend that is taking place. Because every single person that got hired throughout the day is all receiving a penny. And then... When the steward gets to the one that got hired at 6 o'clock in the morning, has borne the burden of the day, and the steward goes, here you are, sir, your penny as contracted. Then the one that got hired at 6 o'clock in the morning is just taken aback. Oh, I can't believe. What? You made us equal to the ones who have... Us who have borne the burden of the day, the 12-hour day, equal to the guy that just got hired at 5 o'clock in the afternoon? And they begin to murmur against the good man of the house. And I want you to think about that. We look at stories like this, and we think about the people that sit here, and we go, what a bunch of entitled jerks, right? But here's a newsflash for you. We are these people. We are so right here. I mean, I deal with it all the time in the Good Samaritan Ranch. I do. Especially, you know, the, the young kids that graduate the program, they come to mom and dad, they go, Dad, Mom, I'm saved now. Give me the keys. It's like, I don't think so. Uh-uh. Right? But we think that now that things are different, now that we're saved, we're entitled to something, right? Or how about this one? Man, I, I, I logged a whole 20 minutes on my face this morning, God, and this is how my day's going to turn out? This is just ridiculous. I can't believe this. Or this is a good one that I hear a lot. Oh, man. I'm graduating next week and I got, I, I just, I just did a solid 61 days in the Good Samaritan program and now I got to do six months of aftercare. <sighs> it's like, really? That's not the song you were singing in the Kootenai County Jail on the phone with MJ. <laughs> and I want you to notice this. Do you see how his expectation Shifted? In the morning, early in the morning, bitch, yeah, man, I'm going to put my boots on and I'm going to work today and I'm going to work all day long and I'm going to earn what I got coming. But it's crazy how throughout the day, and, and why do you think that, that this group of people, why their expectation shifted? What caused that shift in their expectation? Paul put it very clearly in 2 Corinthians. He said, when we start to compare ourselves amongst ourselves, it's never a wise thing to do. 
Now think about this. What if, what if the landowner would have paid the employees in the way that you would usually pay people? Like starting at the one that got hired at uh, 6 o'clock in the morning, if, if he received his penny, he would have just went, thank you, and went right on his way. But because he saw the one that got hired at 5 o'clock in the afternoon receive his penny, man, that shifted his whole idea of what, what the way he perceived things and the way he thought about things, didn't it? Right? It's so important that we remember our humble beginnings. That we remember that Christ redeemed us from hell and destruction and took away my sin. That's all I got coming and I'm so grateful for that. Thank you guys very much for helping us out. <laughs> Amen. Bless you guys. Love you. And so I want you to be able to see this because when we think in those types of terms of what we deserve, what we got coming, looking at what everybody else has got, and our expectation shifts like that, man, that is a dark road to go down. It really is. Because when you get to the end of that road, church, of what you deserve, what you're entitled to, and what you should really expect, what the world should expect, you understand that the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. That what we deserve, that what we're entitled to, is hell and destruction and the bondage of our sin. And so it's so important for our expectation to stay where it needs to be on Christ, who He is, and on Christ alone. You see, guys, life really comes down to two choices, two paths that you can take. You can take what you think you deserve with your focus on everybody else and looking for the next handout from God, right? Or... You can live your life like these other four employee groups off of whatsoever is right. That's what you shall receive. You see, Paul said that the just shall live by faith and that God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And so I don't know about you, but I want to be like Peter. I want to remember my humble beginnings. Why I started following Christ is because of who he was, my Savior. And I want to continue to follow Christ because of who he is, my Savior. And you know what? I want to have the faith and the trust to be able to, 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 to say, okay, God, yeah, I can live off that. I can live off whatsoever is right. I can work. I can do service work. I can live my life off of whatsoever is right. That's what I'm going to receive. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, I want to thank you, God, for your word, your word that is anointed, your word, God, that has free course and does exactly what you desire it to, Lord. And I pray, God, for the ones in this room where their expectation is shifted and they know it because resentment is building in their hearts, because bitterness is there, because they feel bogged down and apathetic concerning their circumstance or where they're at or what they're receiving. God, I pray, Lord, that they can repent and return to their first love and remember their humble beginnings. Help us, God. Help us to get there. Help us to stay there, Lord. Stir us up by remembrance of all your grace and mercy in our lives, Lord, and never let us forget it. We love you because you first loved us. And we can live our lives off that, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Praise the Lord, church. I love you guys. Continue to pray for Pastor Tim the next coming up weeks. And go in peace this week. And remember your, where your expectations should be found. Remember what to expect. <laughs>